Let's take a look at this paper. Always. <laughs> Better Not to Have Children by Gerald Harrison and Julia Tanner. Most people take it for granted that it's morally permissible to have children. They may raise questions about the number of children it's responsible to have or whether it's permissible to reproduce when there's a strong risk of serious disability. But in general, having children is considered a good thing to do, something that's morally permissible in most cases, perhaps even obligatory. In this article, we provide a number of reasons for thinking that it is both wrong and unwise to procreate. Bad for others. Humans are the most destructive creatures on the planet. We cause vast amounts of animal deaths, both directly and indirectly. We destroy habitats. We damage the environment. We are currently heating up the world's climate in a way that is likely to be detrimental to countless numbers of animals, inc uh, ourselves included. And we have the means, nuclear weapons, to destroy everything at the push of a button. We can perilously ch close to pushing that button on one occasion. We came close to... Okay. We came perilously close to pushing that button on one occasion, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. The best way to stop the destruction is to remove the destructive force, to remove humans from refraining from procreation. In short, the colossal amount of harm caused by humans gives us a moral reason to boycott the human species. It might be objected that measures can be taken to limit the harm humans cause to other animals and the environment by, say, recycling more and ceasing to kill animals for food. We should be focusing our efforts on changing our destructive behavior rather than giving up on our children altogether. We should certainly make efforts to curb our destructive behaviors, but even supposing we have sufficient control over ourselves to make such changes, it's doubtful, we have very limited control over how future generations will behave. To procreate is to take an unjustifiable gamble that future generations will behave responsibly, more responsibly than us. Hmm. Given the rather pathetic, late-in-the-day changes humans have managed so far, it is unlikely that future generations will do any better. There's a good chance they'll do worse. There's no evidence... It, there is no evidence... There's no evidence we're aware of that humans are becoming more morally responsive. We should do our best to limit the impact we have, but we should also stop creating more humans. Human beings are dangerous things. Too dangerous. This is... I don't know. I don't like the way this is written. This is, um... I don't know. It's, it's much different than what we just read from Harmon and Benatar. Anyway, just, just the structure, but that's okay. Uh, it might be objected that by this logic we should not only stop procreating, we should start killing existing humans, but this does not follow. It is one thing to forego starting a life, it is quite another to end one already in existence. Humans who already exist have moral status. They have rights. To end a human life is, under normal circumstances, wrong and will violate the human right, that human rights. Failing to start a life does not violate anyone's rights. Only those who exist, did exist, or will exist can have rights. Those who do not, uh, those who do not, have never, and will never exist, have no moral status, no rights to be violated. What about suicide? We wouldn't be violating anyone's rights by committing suicide. Is it possible to claim? Shouldn't we at least do that? We don't think so. There is a limit on the moral demand for altruism. How best to de defend such a limit is no easy matter. And we leave it open here. Wait, what? Uh... How best to defend such a limit is no easy matter, and we leave it open here. Okay. But most recognize that self-sacrifice is beyond any plausible limit there may be. However, the requirement to cease production of new humans is not over-demanding. It is easy to forego procreation. Of course, many will dispute this, arguing that, forego, that to forego procreation and child-rearing is to miss out on a great majority source of human happiness and thus is a very great sacrifice. We will address this concern in section uh, four, is that right? Uh, where we show that the evidence suggests that procreation is actually surprisingly bad for you. In the meantime, we will consider another common objection. Hmm. Bad for the species. Uh, the, ob uh, for the objection goes that if we all forego procreation, then the human species will come to an end, and that is a bad thing. Bad for whom? Uh, 
not for other animals or the environment. It would be good for them. Bad for humans? Well, the human species is not itself a human. It is not owed any moral obligations. It does not have any rights, and it does not have a welfare. The end of human species need not be counter to the interests of any individual human. Or violate any individual human rights. Perhaps some will object to our brisk dismissal of the idea that a species has value in itself, aside from the value of its individual members. But even if we allow that species do have value in themselves, there are still strong reasons for thinking the end of human species would be a good thing overall. The world is currently undergoing the Holocene extinction event. Um, it's the fastest mass extinction event in Earth's known history, and it's accelerating. In the last 50 years, the rate of extinction has soared. It's now estimated that between 100 and 40 thousand and two million species become extinct every century that's between four and 54 a day the scientific consensus is that it's largely down to humans we are the cause if one thinks that species in themselves have value if one is serious about preventing species uh, preserving species then the demise of the human species looks as if it should be welcomed hmm sounding very like voluntary human extension movement-esque. Uh, it, sh it might be suggested that the end of the human species would be a bad thing because of a lot of currently existing humans have a brute, pr uh, a brute preference for it to continue. Such preferences would be frustrated and this is bad. First, if the human species became extinct, becomes extinct, then by definition, the, bearer, the bearers of those preferences will no longer exist. Some might consider this cancels the preferences or seriously reduces their clout. Second, any human preference, uh, preference for the continuation of the species has to compete with vast numbers of other animals' interests in our non-continuation. It is unlikely that these human preferences would win out by any reasonable estimation the numbers of sentient non-human creatures with morally important interests vastly outnumbers the human population. Third, not all preferences count alike. Many philosophers accept that selfish or or unreasonable preferences don't count or count less. The preference that the human species continue despite the incredible harm, such continuation, uh, despite the incredible harm, such continuation will do to other species is an unreasonable preference that should either not count at all or count very little. That was very vehement-esque. Uh, part three, bad for the child. It might be argued that having a child uh, confers a benefit on that child. They get to exist. But it is questionable whether existence is, in general, a benefit to the existor. It may be more of a burden than a boon. Granted, if you ask them, most people will say their lives are worth living. In fact, most people will say their lives are going better than most people's. But there are powerful psychological factors at play here. Our self-assessments are well known. Uh, of well-being are known to be heavily biased towards the positive. The philosopher David Benatar, better known to have been, Oxford University Press, 2006, page 71, has argued that a sober assessment of the gains and losses in an average life could well yield a negative result overall, especially when you add in all the minor but regular negative mental states associated with hunger, thirst, bowel and bladder distension, tiredness, stress, thermal discomfort, itchiness, etc. Benetra, page 71. Even if benefits outweigh burdens with a life, within a life, there's no escaping the fact that we die. Most agree that our deaths harm us greatly, not the Epicureans. I question this. I don't know if that's true. Most people I talk to are Epicureans when it comes to the badness of death. I think I'm, I don't know, I feel like I've been a minority in that view. Again, it depends who you hang out with. Uh, the end our lives. Lives that we have become invested in. That we'd very much like to continue. These sorts of considerations make it uncomfortably plausible that it may be better never to have lived at all than to have lived and died. But even if life is beneficial overall, it doesn't follow that it was permissible to subject someone to it. Children often, resentfully, point out to their parents that they didn't choose to be born. They have a point. Ordinarily, it is wrong to subject something to someone. Wait, subject someone to something 
Ordinarily, we must gain someone's consent before doing something that will significantly affect them. To subject someone to a life is to significantly affect them without their prior consent. Some might object to procreative acts. Do uh, some might object that procreative acts do not affect those they bring into existence? Someone who has been brought into existence didn't exist previously, and so cannot have been made better or worse off, and so was not affected. Uh, wait a minute. Someone who has been brought into existence didn't exist previously, and so cannot have been made better or worse off. And so was not affected. All right. Uh, but anyone who takes such a view is going to have to judge that someone whose life is clearly not going to be worth living, someone's whose life, someone who, uh, someone whose life will be characterized by constant chronic pain, has not been negatively affected by being sub uh, subjected to an existence. We think this is highly counterintuitive. Furthermore. If you can't be negatively affected by being brought into existence, you can't be positively affected either. Existence cannot be a benefit for the existent. It might be pointed out that we cannot gain someone's consent to exist. We cannot gain their consent before they exist. And by the time they exist, it's too late. But the fact that we cannot gain their consent does not mean that we are free to do without it. Suppose you wish to torture someone against their will. You cannot seek their victim's consent. The torture would not then be against their will. It would be absurd to argue that for this reason we are per permitted to torture people against their will. Wait a minute, what? Suppose you wish to torture someone against their will. You cannot seek your victim's consent. Wait. You wish to torture someone against their will. Okay, so that means they don't want it, right? You cannot seek your victim's consent. I mean, it implies that it's against their will. You just said it. The torture would not then be against their will. What? The torture would not then be against their will. Uh. Suppose you wish to torture someone against their will. You cannot get their consent. The torture would not then be against their will. Mm, pretty sure once you're torturing them, it would be against their will. It would be absurd to argue that for this reason we are permitted to torture people against their will. Okay. Similarly, the fact that procreative prospective parents cannot get the consent of those they plan to bring into existence doesn't magically mean it's okay. Quite the opposite. If you can't get the consent of the person you're going to significantly affect by your action, then the default position is that you don't do whatever it is that's going to affect them. There are exceptions. Pushing someone out of the way of a falling piano is morally right even if no prior consent can be given. If, for instance, there isn't time. But, in this kind of case, you are preventing someone from coming to great harm. To procreate, to subject someone to a life, does not prevent them, com uh, does not prevent them coming to harm. Not being created cannot harm them because they don't exist. Perhaps it will be objected that if life is an overall benefit, then subject subjecting that someone to such a life is not wrong. But there is an interesting asymmetry between preventing someone coming to harm and benefiting someone. Intuitively, it is far more important to prevent causing and or allowing harm to befall others than it is to possibly benefit others. Benefiting someone without their prior consent requires greater justification than preventing them being harmed. For instance... If we know you'll really enjoy the experience induced by a certain recreational drug, but we know you'll refuse to take the drug of your own vo volition, it is not permissible for us to pop it in your tea behind your back. Benefiting someone without their consent can probably only be justified when the, cons the benefit is considerable. Can only probably only be justified when the benefit is considerable. And this could well be because unless we benefit the person, their life will go less well. Unless we benefit the person, their life will go less well. Sometimes we miss out. Note, in the case of non-procreation, the non-exister 
does not miss out. If we do not procreate, the non-existents do not have lives that go less well than they otherwise would. But even if we were wrong, and it turns out the most lives rec uh, record a high net benefit and there's nothing wrong in subjecting someone to s existence, the fact remains that procreating harms the interests of others currently existing and future existing animals in the environment to procreate because one believes life is a benefit to those who are subjected to it is to take a very real gamble. First, one gambles the life really is an overall benefit to the individual living it. Second, it is someone else who will be harmed if your gamble doesn't pay off, someone whose consent you do not have. Third, one ignores the harms that procreation does to others. And note, if you don't gamble, if you don't procreate, then you haven't harmed the non-existent. The person you didn't bring into existence hasn't been deprived of anything. They don't, didn't, and will never exist. Part four, bad for you. Even if one has no concern for other animals, the environment, or the child one intends to create and focuses only on oneself, having children is most likely a bad idea. Most people assume that having children is a rewarding exercise, even a necessary ingredient uh, uh, of a complete and happy life. But a cold, hard look at the facts suggests otherwise. Children rarely make a net contribution to a parent's self-assessed levels of happiness. And remember, people tend to overestimate their happiness levels. In anonymous surveys, most parents report regretting having children. 70% of people would not have had children if they knew what it would be like. Anne Lander's advice column. Wait, what? 70% of people say kids... 70% uh, of parents say kids not worth it. A uh, syndicated U.S. newspaper, 1975. They're using evidence of an advice column? What? Well, I gotta look into this. Only 5% of men and a third of women said having children improved their happiness level. Kate Stanley, Laura Edwards, The Lever, Ferberg Family Report 2003, Choosing Happiness, Becky Hatch Institute of Public Policy Research, 1,500 couples surveyed. I gotta look into this. All right. Survey on Parenthood, Anne Landers was a syndicated advice columnist who daily column was published in over newspaper U.S. and Canada. People wrote, um, is that appropriate to cite this, like an advice column from a newspaper as a source for this? I don't think this is a good source. Especially especially if it's like from 1975. Anyways, let me move on from this. I don't think that's... Whatever. Uh, only 5% of men and a third of women said having children improved their happiness levels. Um, wait, what was that again? Studies have shown that while people's happiness goes up when they are expecting a baby, it sharply declines once the child is born. And the evidence is, the more children you have, the more unhappy you are likely to be. Professor Daniel Gilbert at the Happiness and its Causes Conference. Happiness levels only start going back up after the child leaves home. Uh, Daniel Gilbert stumbling on happiness. Hmm. I wonder like how many people he surveyed. 
like opinion polls and surveys i don't know it's not i feel like it's not strong evidence but whatever uh some might think that after a lifetime of offspring induced unhappiness you can at least look forward to an old age where your children care for you but in the west the number who care full-time for their elderly parents is comparatively small not having children is probably a much better pension plan when they reach old age the child less are more financially secure and in better health than parents okay j rempel childless elderly what are they missing journal of marriage in the family hmm. okay none of this makes child creation and rearing sound like a recipe for flourishing it sounds like a major obstacle to a happy life and at least in the majority of cases hmm all right now i'm skeptical of some of these claims empirically just given these sources but i'd have to look more into it uh better not to have children our case is hard to accept the opposite view that creating and child rearing are valuable and rewarding a major component of a fully flourishing human life is deeply rooted and receives constant promotion but we have provided a number of reasons why procreation might be wrong and shown why some common objections are misguided it is bad for animals and the environment existence may not be the benefit many take it to be it may be wrong to subject someone to existence without first gaining their consent especially given that failing to procreate does not deprive the non-existent of anything finally becoming a parent and rearing children is unlikely to bring happiness it seems to us then that it is better not to have children dr gerald harrison is a lecturer at massey university new zealand Dr. Julia Tanner recently completed her PhD at Durham University. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they made their case really strong. It was just I feel like it's a it's a supplement to the asymmetry, but I could be wrong on that. Um all right. Let's uh let's post this in the group. 